Good evening, and welcome to the Ruth Ratner Miller Memorial Award for Excellence in American History. I am not Sherry Litwack. Sherry has laryngitis, and we're happy that she can still be here tonight. I'm, can you hear me? Okay. I'm Claire Green, representing the Friends of the Concord Free Public Library, and it's our great pleasure to host this event. This award honors Mrs. Miller for her commitment to civic engagement and the importance of the lessons of history. We're fortunate tonight to have a Robert J. Allison from Suffolk University here to introduce our honoree, Pauline Meyer. You can see from the program that Bob Allison is a professor of history at Suffolk and that he has written many books. What you can't see in the program is that he has won numerous awards for excellence in teaching from the Harvard Extension, from the Suffolk University Student Government, and from Suffolk University. So therefore, it is very appropriate for him to be introducing someone who we are honoring as both a scholar and a teacher. Um, Professor Allison also has received recognition from the teaching company for whom he created the class seven, before 1776, Life in the American Colonies. And I'll just mention that here at the Concord Free Public Library, you are able to check out those videos, in part because the Friends of the Library support the purchase of electronic books and materials. And if you'd like to join the Friends, I'd be happy to speak with you later. Um, Professor Allison was also a consultant to the Commonwealth Museum at the State Archives in Boston, and he's on the board of trustees of the USS Constitution Museum. So please welcome Bob Allison. Well, thank you very much, Claire. And I can't imagine a greater honor I could get than to be invited here to Concord to introduce my good friend, Holly Mayer. Um, and I know all, all American historians feel that Emerson is looking over their shoulder, so uh, <laughs> I'm used to this. And I also can't imagine a better recipient for the Ruth Ratner, Ratner Miller Award than um, Pauline. And just following on what Claire said, what, the things you can't see in the program, I know we're honoring Pauline for her, or should I say Professor Mayer? Oh, her. Um, her contributions to history, which are formidable. Um, I'm also thinking about other things that are worthy of mention. For example, this year she and her husband Charles have been married for 50 years, which is, I hear a groan, I thought there was no <laughs> And they have three children, two of whom are here, and five grandchildren, three of whom are also with us tonight. And that's an extraordinary that's eight extraordinary achievements plus the 50 years. And she is, as you know, the William R. Kennan Jr. Professor of American History at MIT. She's also taught, among other places, at the University of Wisconsin at Madison and at UMass Boston. And when she was a high school senior in St. Paul, Minnesota, she followed a friend who was going to a Radcliffe orientation session, or in a session to entice St. Paul girls to come to Radcliffe, a place of which she had never heard. She didn't know what Radcliffe was, um, but she very quickly came to the attention of the recruiters, because unlike the other young women in the class, she raised her hand and asked a question. And I've known Pauline to ask questions, which do have a way of grab grabbing your attention and making you think. And this is what brought her then to Radcliffe, where she spent four years, comping the Harvard Crimson, where she met her future husband, Charles. And then after, um, she also worked for the Patriot, uh, the Quincy Patriot Ledger, an eminent newspaper on the South Shore of Boston, and then returned to graduate school in the mid-1960s to begin her study of the American Revolution. And over the years since, she has illuminated our understanding of the revolution, what caused it, what, what were its repercussions, and she continues to do that. Her article on popular uprisings in 18th century America, which was published in the William and Mary Quarterly in 1970, uh, received the Quarterly's Douglas Adair Award for the best article published over the previous eight years. 
And for those of us who study early American history, that eight-year period was among the most exceptional in historical scholarship. So her article is well worth noting. And then in 1993, it was reprinted in their volume of the most influential articles published in the quarterly's then 50-year existence. And of course, that argument or um, an elaboration of that idea appeared in her first book, From Resistance to Revolution, which really shows how this resistance movement of the 1760s became the revolutionary movement of the 1770s, an extraordinary book. And followed that with a book called Old Revolutionaries, which is one of my favorite books of history. It's personality sketches of men who had been young during the revolution and then grew old. And what were their reflections on this experience of their lives, this seminal experience in the life of the nation? She also wrote a textbook, as Claire said. Uh, actually, she, she's written two textbooks. One is for middle school students, and it is called The American People, A History. And then more recently, in 2002, she and other collaborators produced Inventing America, which is a textbook on, fittingly for someone who spent most of her career at MIT, it's about invention and about technology and about the way Americans have changed their environment and the landscape. American scripture in 1997 it's about making the Declaration of Independence, but it's really much more. It's about the decision for independence. And Pauline has done, I suppose, as much as more than anyone else to demystify Thomas Jefferson. And one of the areas in which she and I disagree is she says he's the most underrated man in American history. Um, I don't know if she still feels that. And I'm not going to argue the point, but what she shows in this book is that the decision for independence was made in people in the towns of New England and other places. And so when Jefferson wrote the Declaration, it was a decision that had already been made in the towns of New England and in other places. And following that, MIT presented her with the Killian Award, which is a Lifetime Achievement Award for senior faculty. Although it's clear in 1997, her lifetime of achievement was not nearly over, as she continues on with um, her new book, which we'll be talking about tonight, uh, Ratification, The People Debate the Constitution, this was named by the Wall Street Journal one of the 10 best books in the year 2010. Not best history books, but best books. And I have no reason to doubt their judgment. The New York Times Book Review called it one of the 100 notable books of the year 2010. And it is an extraordinary book about the decision for ratification. There have been a raft of books written on the Constitutional Convention but as you probably know, James Madison, who had as much reason as anyone to, as much right as anyone to have an opinion on this, said if you really want to understand the Constitution and what it meant to the people who wrote it, don't look at the convention, look at the ratification debates, because that is where the American people talked about what the Constitution meant. And her book not only has the notable men we've all heard of, Madison, Jay, Henry, it has lots of other people weighing in on this. Amos Singletary, Isaac Backus, Willie Jones, other characters whom she makes vivid in their arguments, their debates, an argument which she makes clear we are still having today about what the Constitution means. The book received the George Washington Book Prize, which is administered by the C.V. Starr Center at Washington College. Incidentally, Washington College is the first college in the country named for George Washington and the only one named for him during his lifetime. It's in uh, Chesterton, Maryland. And appropriately, she received the award at Mount Vernon. I can't think of anything, any higher accolade for an historian on the revolution than to be invited to Mount Vernon to receive an award bearing Washington's name. And also it received the Francis Tavern Award given at Francis Tavern in New York, where Washington in 1783 bid farewell to his troops. And it's fitting, the book begins and ends with Washington. So having it received those two eminent awards is entirely fitting. And of course, having Pauline Mayer receive an award here in Concord, where I understand the revolution had some impact here. Um, <laughs> And the revolution, of course, continues, and the debate over ratification and the meanings of the revolution and the Constitution continue. 
So it's a tremendous honor for me to be able to introduce to you Pauline Mayer. Thank you, Bob, and I just, after all these years, can't call you Professor Allison. <laughs> um, thank you for coming and for, uh, for your wonderful introduction. I am very, uh, to say I'm pleased to be here is a massive understatement. Uh, I have written, I like to think, a number of respectable books over the course of my career, but none of them won any prizes until ratification. And I certainly never before received an award for excellence in American history. Uh, it is a great honor to join the distinguished American historians who have already received the Ruth Ratner Miller Award and to receive it the year after it was given to Bernard Bailyn, who directed my doctoral work, is especially awesome. And I want to thank everybody who had uh, any hand or a voice in uh, the decision to give me this prize. And I also want to call to attention the members of my family who are here. My husband, Charles, who is himself a historian. Where did he? There he is. Was, he's backed up to the second row. Uh, my daughter, Jessica, who's an art historian at Mount Holyoke College. My son, Nicholas, who is a businessman who sells publishing services. You see, the apple doesn't drop too far from the tree, as they say. His wife, Caroline Gray, and my three grandchildren, Corinne, uh, who's 11, Alina, who just turned seven yesterday, and Copeland, who is 15 months and we hope will be quiet. <laughs> we can't make promises. That bottle should help a lot. <laughs> the girls' presence is a particular pleasure for me, but it also presented something of a challenge. What could I say tonight that wouldn't put them to sleep? Uh, when I wondered about that out loud and in their presence a few weeks ago, Alina had a wonderful suggestion. She said she is very interested in horses. <laughs> I thought that subject might be a stretch for an audience expected to hear about American history, but maybe not. Alina, be patient. I think you might not be disappointed in the end. In some ways, the challenge goes both ways. Corinne, I remember, asked me a few years ago what I did for a living. Uh, the job of someone who sells things or delivers mail or drives a bus is clear. But what does a historian do? I tried to explain, explain, probably emphasizing the teaching part of my work life, thinking that would have some connection with her experience. Corinne wrinkled a brow and said, so you are kind of like a gym teacher. <laughs> well, not exactly, but it did dawn on me that it wasn't at all bad to have my clear-headed, tell it like it is granddaughter, think that her 70-year-old grandmother could actually be a gym teacher. <laughs> Perhaps I ought to have told her that I spend my days pulling to together stories of the American past from old books and manuscripts. The root of history, the word, is of course the word story. But the mission of a historian goes beyond telling what happened. We want to know why what happened happened and what difference events made. To some people, the writing of the, of the story of the past is an awesome job. I kind of share that sense. I had a friend, the late Nan Friedlander, an economist, Radcliffe classmate, and fellow MIT faculty member, who once asked me what I studied. We hadn't seen each other for years, and she certainly had no idea what I'd done my graduate work on. And when I, after I answered, she said, history. I have always thought of history as having to do with wisdom. Some profound understanding, she assumed, would come from studying human conduct over time. Alternatively, people assume that the job of history is to discover truth. Goya once painted a very moving painting of history, which he portrayed as a young woman writing in a book as Father Time led truth from the shadows. Most historians make no pretense of purveying anything so profound as wisdom or truth. They settle for occasional insights into the past and for accuracy in the sense of making no obvious mistakes or saying, and, and, or saying nothing at odds with their sources. They ask questions, some narrow, some others great in scope, and gather evidence to answer them. 
Once historians told enormous stories. Think of Francis Parkman's History of France in America, or Elliot, uh, Samuel Eliot Morrison's volumes on the European voyages of discovery. History was a branch of literature. We don't hear much about that anymore either, although the possibility of writing artfully remains real for both academic and popular historians. It has long been part of my ambition as a historian to write books that meet the scholarly standards of academic history, but that are written in a way that appeals to a wider audience than historians alone. Historical research and writing have been, for me, a passion. I also love teaching, but I used to say that I taught history to support my, uh, I taught to support my history habit. Since, like Bob Allison, I've spent most of my career teaching undergraduates, not graduate students, research and writing have been something of a leisure time activity for those days or weeks when I didn't have to teach. But writing history is actually another form of teaching, but for an audience larger than would fit in my classrooms. There's not, nothing I wish more for my grandchildren than to find a way of earning a living that they love doing and can do well. I found the good life as a historian, a professional decision that bewildered my mother, though she supported my decision to do whatever I wanted to do. Uh, one of my children found it in art history. My animal-loving granddaughters might find it as veterinarians or zookeepers or horse trainers or in some fascinating activity they have yet to discover. I don't understand, uh, I, I don't underestimate the importance of skill and hard work, but in retrospect, luck has been with me in my life as a historian. But now that I'm in Providence, and I think of this, maybe luck should be translated into what the new, early New Englanders called Providence. Maybe God's been watching out. There are some patterns that were beyond anything I could have uh, chosen myself. I mean, I ended up at Radcliffe before I'd ever heard anything about it. I mean, that was, was it luck or providence? I don't know. And I got there, I have to say, because of a man in St. Paul and his wife who went around and collected money from rich people, who I guess is sort of like we are, uh, in $200 supplements. Uh, and the man's name was James Otis. Now, does that sound? <laughs> Some fate was at work. In any case, I, I got my, uh, I, I went to graduate school without having it crossed my mind that none of my college professors were women. Then just as I got my PhD, all right, okay, the doors of opportunity opened. My luck, I think, has held out over the years and came into play with my recent book. In the late 1990s, my agent, Jill Neerham, who was also a classroom at uh, called me uh, to tell me that an editor at Simon & Schuster was looking for an American historian to write a narrative history of the ratification of the Constitution. He had spoken to her because she was at an agency that handled a lot of American historians. I just love that idea of having an agent who handles historians. It makes us sound like racehorses, Alina. <laughs> <laughs> Books on the founding era were selling well, and he had discovered that there were, was no good book on that subject for a general, or for that matter, an academic audience. Who should she contact? I told her, I'll do it with unseemly haste. I was excited by the prospect of writing a book designed from the beginning to be a narrative, that is, to tell a great story. Just as I hadn't noticed the lack of women professors in the 1950s, however, I didn't bother to ask why nobody had written such a book before. And the reason I learned was that the documentary record was so huge and scattered that it would take more than a single professional life to master. And I am unaware that God is accepting applications from historians for second lives because they couldn't finish their books. <laughs> Also, the debates in the state conventions that decided the Constitution's fate would, of course, be at the center of the book I'd agreed to write. Uh, but in many cases, they were not recorded. And where they were recorded, they had the records had serious flaws. Uh, in 1986, James Hudson, who is the head of the Manuscript Division at the Library of Congress, 
had an article in the Texas Law Review. And he pointed out, of course, that many of these debates were not recorded, and that for the others, shorthand was a new skill in the late 18th century. And it took something like five years to master it. And the people who were taking down the debates hadn't put in five years. <laughs> you know, they missed not just sentences or paragraphs. They missed whole speeches and occasionally whole days. Uh, moreover, before they published them, they showed the speeches to the speakers who could c correct them. And of course, that corrupted the record. And finally, they were, the, re the published debates are very biased. They, uh, they were biased in favor of ratifying the Constitution because it was Federalists who often paid the shorthand men or owned the newspapers for which they wrote, and they subsidized the publication of the debates because they thought the Federalists were the greatest speakers and these would be, in a, in a sense, propaganda, or propaganda is not the right word, but they would give powerful arguments uh, that would convince people that they should support the Constitution. The Pennsylvania Ratifying Convention, I should say, are the worst. They include the speakers of two federal, uh, the speeches of two Federalists. It's as if they were talking or arguing with themselves. <laughs> Nobody else was there, except one of the uh, critics of the Constitution interrupted and managed to get his name in the published debates of the Pennsylvania Convention. Massachusetts was a little better. See, I wrote this speech because then I, I thought otherwise I would get too long, and here I am going off of text. But I have to tell you, the Massachusetts is really wonderful. I exaggerate a bit for effect, but the fellow who was taking down the notes said at one point, ah, it was a day like every other day that anti-federalists made their silly objections to the Constitution, the Federalists answered them, I just can't take all this nonsense down. <laughs> and you got to wonder about the stuff he did take down. How fair was he? to those speakers with whom he, he didn't agree. In any case, after reviewing all these problems, Hudson concluded that the debates were so, the published debates were so bad that it would be impossible to understand the original intent or the original understanding of the Constitution on the part of the ratifiers. And that's bad news for jurists. It was not good news for historians. But everything's changed in the past 25 years. Uh, and I knew something of this. I knew that there was a massive uh, publication project out of the University of Wisconsin called the Documentary History of the Ratification of the Constitution. Uh, but I didn't realize uh, what, what a dramatic impact that it made. In fact, it revolutionized the study of ratification. What it did for the conventions in particular was to collate the published debates where they exist with the series of other sources day by day, uh, the official journals, the notes kept by delegates and other witnesses. Now, you didn't have, you have notes by delegates to the federal convention, but you don't have any people in the audience who are making notes on it because the federal conventions were, of course, secret. Federal convention was secret. And then there's a mass of private correspondence. Uh, and newspaper accounts. So he put all of these together. We're not dependent on any one source. And if you look at them and compare them, well, occasionally you say, were these guys in the same hall? And okay, but by and large, you can tease out what probably actually happened. Enough, I think, that we can tell the story with, relatively con with relative confidence. Uh, uh, but, um, by the time I'd finished the manuscript, I, and I have to say that because it's an ongoing project, the documentary history had published 21 volumes. Of those, 14 were on uh, ratification in individual states, and most of them had come out since Hudson had uh, published his article. And uh, there they were, ready for me to use. Uh, I was um, uh, obviously extremely fortunate uh, in, in that regard. Uh, the DHRC still has five states to go, but it's covered the most important, and I literally could not have written the book I wrote without the fifth volume on New York, which came out in 2009. I, I didn't know that. My, ma my contract said I would produce a manuscript by 2004. I didn't. Uh, 
but uh, the volume, that, that volume, uh, the volume which is the fifth volume on ratification in New York, moved the possibility of writing a comprehensive history of ratification from nearly impossible to doable. In effect, I was under contract to write a narrative history of the ratification of the Constitution pr at pretty much the earliest point it could be done. I was also at a point in my career where I could handle the topic. In writing the book, I felt day by day that I was drawing on all the skills in my craft that I had developed over the previous four decades. And, and all of that came together from my perception fortuitously, or shall we say, providentially. The book also made me aware of what a privilege it is to be part of the community of historians. Fellow historians willingly shared their research and their expertise with me. Nobody I asked to read a part of the manuscript refused, and one of the editors of the DHRC, Rich Leffler, who knows the material inside and out, volunteered to read the entire manuscript. And on the first occasion, he met me, if you can believe it. My book would be the first on its subject, he said, and he wanted it to be as good as it could be. Meanwhile, the general editor, John Kaminsky, sent me PDF copies of pages on the New York Convention that he thought correctly I would need before they were officially published. In the end, although my name is on the title page, I realize that the book itself is something of a collaborative achievement. In fact, I suspect that's true of a lot of historical work. My book, however, rests solidly on the work of others, editors and fellow historians who lent their support willingly and without compensation, out of friendship and a common commitment to the historical enterprise. Okay, the book is in print, so what? That's always the big question. That's what Bud Balin taught me. Well, it makes a difference for understanding 18, uh, how 18th century Americans understood the Constitution, and that has significance for law. I think it's much more important than the Federalist Papers. Why? Because the conventions went through the Constitution, provision by provision. Some parts were controversial or were discussed at length. In other cases, people, a delegate would simply ask, what does this provision mean? And another would answer. Maybe he had been a delegate to Philadelphia. Maybe in Massachusetts he was a member of the Supreme Judicial Court. But don't think that the answers they gave were just accepted passively. Some delegate from some rural constituency since he would say, well, that's what you think. But as I read it, it doesn't say that so clearly. And the text should say what it means so that it's clear to everybody. Uh, they were not cowed by authority. I think New Englanders who were told the priest shouldn't tell them what the Bible means uh, were pretty confident they could read any text and figure it out and nobody was going to tell them what the Constitution meant, that was for sure. Uh, I also think it makes a terrific difference for understanding, as you might expect, and maybe this is less surprising, the whole ratification process. This has traditionally been told as a fight between Federalists and Anti-Federalists. Well, before I got awfully far, I realized anti-federalist was a federalist term, and it was a term of opprobrium, and that all of these, this two-sided business was a mistake. And there, there were many more shades of opinion, and that if we were to understand the way the Constitution was ratified, we had to come to terms with all of those different shades of opinion and notice how critical parts of, of, of the political landscape shifted over time in response to changing circumstances. I think I do that in the course of the book. Uh, I, of course, one of the great uh, truisms in American history is that one of the products of the whole ratification controversy was the Bill of Rights. Uh, that is the first 10 amendments to the Constitution. I have a little different take on that too. I mean, I think that the rights that those who demanded amendments most wanted uh, are not those at the top of our heads. Uh, they were really very concerned with no taxation without representation. They were concerned with weakness of provisions on representation. Uh, the first uh, House of Representatives would have had only 65 members. If ever town had sent the number of delegates it wanted to the lower house of Massachusetts General Court, it would have had almost 400 people in it. So it looked pretty puny, this House of Representatives. 
And if the representation was inadequate, why did Congress have wall-to-wall -wall taxing power in Article One, Section uh, uh, Section Eight? Uh, these were the big issues that for for them. And I think Madison proposed the amendments to the Constitution, the first federal Congress, to parry an amendment which would have undercut that ubiquitous taxing power, that wall-to-wall -wall taxing power. That was the only proposed amendment Washington said he had any objections to. Uh, and so we got a set of amendments that were written to undercut the demands of those who most wanted amendments. And what I discovered is that nobody, not Washington, not Jefferson, the great friend of bills of rights, not <coughs> Madison, not any of those who had been most vocal earlier in demanding rights called the first 12 amendments which were proposed by Congress in 1789 or the 10 of them that were ratified by December of 1791, a Bill of Rights. Indeed, at Kilbury de Mar at Yale Law School says that no Supreme Court justice called the first 10 amendments, which is the term they used, a Bill of Rights until after the Civil War. So I think this is a much more complicated history than most of us uh, have assumed, and I'm occasionally tempted to take it on, although it seems so obvious. If you've written a book on the Declaration of Independence and the ratification of the Constitution, to do a book on the Bill of Rights, you'd think, doesn't Polly Mayer have more imagination? I, I don't know. Finally, I think a good story is its own justification. And from the opening round in Pennsylvania, where the Constitution supporters almost blew it, through the game-saving strategy of Massachusetts, the heart-stopping decision of New Hampshire's ratifying convention to adjourn without voting, Patrick Henry's game-stealing performance at the Virginia Convention in Richmond, the cliffhanger New York Convention in Poughkeepsie, and North Carolina's stubborn no, even after the unamended Constitution had more than the nine state, state votes required for it to go into effect over those states. The story of the Constitution's ratification is a terrific story. And it's a dramatic one, ten, full of tension, certainly for readers who understand that the year between September 17, 1787, when the Federal Convention adjourned, in September 13, 1788, when the Confederation Congress officially declared the Constitution ratified and made arrangements for the first federal elections, was a critical juncture in American history. It lay between our feeble national origins in the 1780s and the strength and international respectability we later acquired and, I think, struggle now to maintain. That year saw many dramatic moments, some of the best of which were, in fact, in Massachusetts. My editor's favorite moment was when John Hancock was carried into the Massachusetts Convention, as the sources say, wrapped in flannel. Uh, the man was an extremely popular governor. He had, to no small extent, brought the state together after Shays' Rebellion. Boston elected it one of its, uh, him one of its delegates to the convention, and the convention immediately chose it as its president, even though he wasn't there. He was home at his mansion on Beacon Hill, recovering from a case of gout. Now, those were, there were those who said it was a political disease, and as soon as it became clear how the convention would vote, he'd get better soon enough. Uh, instead, the Federalists <coughs> cut a deal with him and he chose to make his appearance in this dramatic fashion. The voting, I think, in the Masters Convention is almost as good. Uh, the, 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 the convention had taken over a church on Long Lane, which is now Federal Street. Uh, why? Because uh, it was big enough to accommodate not only the delegates, but the hundreds of people who wanted to hear the debates. Uh, and when the vote finally came, the place was stuffed to the gills. Now you have 365, 64 delegates who actually came. Uh, you had galleries that were designed to hold 600 to 800 people. 
There were people also in something called the cellar, which is not a basement, I gather, but a, but a mezzanine. In effect, every square inch of the place was packed with people. And, and it was very tense, because nobody was quite sure how the, the, the vote was going to go. Uh, nonetheless, apparently, it, the whole hall, the whole church, got so quiet that you could hear a coin drop. And the only noise was that of the clerk calling out the names of the delegates, and then they would answer, yay or nay. And you could just imagine people keeping their records wondering, oh, we didn't think he was going to vote that way. How's that going to change the total? In the end, Massachusetts ratified 187 to 168 with nine delegates absent. That's a margin of, of 19 votes uh, in, out of 365 uh, people. Uh, who were there. That's, if nine people had shifted, they could have gone the other way. It was very, very close. But once the vote was taken, the bells all over Federalist Boston started to ring. Look, this is a story, I didn't make it up. I just <laughs> recorded it out of, the, out of the sources. But it was a lost story. But when I read what I wrote, I have to say, I get kind of choked up. I just think that between the silence of the hall and the tolling of the bells, it just seems like such, a, such an amazing thing to have happened. Oh, then there were the characters. Some of you might have heard of James Wilson of Pennsylvania, a brilliant, if arrogant, lawyer who became a Supreme Court Associate Justice. But what about his formidable opponent, the self-educated Irish immigrant William Findlay? The old Massachusetts lawyer William Symes, who dared to question his old law teacher the for forbidding Theophilus Parson, and one. Francis Dana, the first American minister to, uh, to Russia, and a frail man whose oratory nonetheless left the throngs crowding into the convention in Boston, and even some reporters absolutely spellbound. The, uh, the reporters were so entranced with the speech that they forgot to take notes. <laughs> Jonathan Smith, a farmer from the western part of the state whose heartfelt endorsement of the Constitution based on the agony of living through Shays' Rebellion came at exactly the right moment. Or Zachariah Johnston, whom one observer called the best speaker at the Virginia Convention. Better, it seems, even than Patrick Henry or James Madison. And I should say that Jefferson called Henry the greatest orator of all time. And that was amazing from Jefferson because he really hated Patrick Henry. He hated him so much he was bad mouthing him to his descendants when Henry was in his grave for two decades. Now, I think that's ungracious. <laughs> I was personally awed by James Iredell's probing analysis of the Constitution, North Carolina's first convention. It had two. And also thought his leading opponent, Judge Samuel Spence, uncommonly <coughs> good. Above all, however, there was Melanchthon Smith, an unprepossessing uh, squat man with unruly hair, without whose efforts the New York Convention would probably not have voted to ratify, and his friend and fellow congressman Nathan Dane of Massachusetts, who sent Smith some of the wisest, most statesmanlike political counsel I encountered in all my readings. That there were so many such men is itself significant. It shows that the country was not dependent on a handful of great men. The United States had a deep bench. That's not to say Washington wasn't indispensable, or Hamilton wasn't brilliant, or Madison wasn't learned. In the end, however, there were others who might have moved forward into national office, and sometimes did, but who more often spent their political lives within their states. They and also their constituents, an important part of the story, invested their minds and their hearts in evaluating the Constitution and its probable impact on what they repeatedly called millions yet unborn. I thought of giving, using that as a title for the book, but my editor said it would immediately be assumed that the book was about abortion. <laughs> He's probably right. That in the end, these people supported ratification is only part of their gifts to their country. As I say in the book, they made the republic work. 
was very satisfying to be able to give them finally the place in American history that they had earned so long ago. It felt like an act of historical justice long overdue. It also was satisfying to give my country a missing half, the missing half of its founding story. We have had the elite part, the story of those 55 demigods, as Jefferson called them, who wrote the Constitution. Now we also have the democratic part of the story, the part that tells us how an energized people who knew their power and took their responsibilities seriously shaped the future of their nation. Perhaps that's the part we need most to know. It moves the story down to earth, gives us models, and maybe inspiration. But come to think of it, there's still a part of the story missing, the story of all those unsung creatures who made it possible for the delegates to meet. This is your part, Alina, wake up. <laughs> think, for example, of Dummer Sewell's horse. Uh, Sewell was a delegate for Maine, which was still part of Massachusetts. He was, we can agree, unfortunate in his first name. I suspect he would have rather been called Jonathan, or Sewell, or Jonathan, or Samuel, or Smarter Sewell. What a thing to do. I mean, probably family name, but how would you like to be called Dumber Mayor? Wouldn't it be good? Yeah. In any case, if he was unfortunate in his first name, he was blessed in his horse who remains nameless. We don't even know if it was male or female or what color it was, but Sewell climbed on its back at home in Bath, Maine at 11 in the morning on January 3rd, 1788, and set out for Boston in the company of another delegate, Nathaniel Wyman for nearby, from nearby Georgetown, also on horseback. The going was hard, there had been a heavy snowfall the night before, and they had not yet invented snow plows. They made it only to North Yarmouth, maybe 20, 30 miles from Bath, after a full day of riding. Stopped for the night at the Widow Mitchell's, and that then set out at sunrise the next day. By Sunday the 6th, when Sewell said it was exceeding cold, they were in York, Maine, hadn't even made it to Massachusetts, to New Hampshire yet. But on Monday, they took a ferry a path across the Piscataqua River to Portsmouth, New Hampshire, then another across the Merrimack. They stopped in Rowley, Massachusetts, between Newburyport and Ipswich for the night, then mounted early on Tuesday the 8th, the day before the convention was supposed to meet. But as they got near Danvers, once the center of the Salem witchcraft crisis, they were forced to stop as the falling snow turned to rain and the wind became a very violent storm. Again, they set out on the ninth before dawn. There was, um, they were almost at their destination, but first they had to find a place to board their horses while they were at the convention, which, it strikes me, makes parking in Boston look like child's play. <laughs> By the time Sewell and his companion arrived, the convention had already begun. The trip, which today takes about two hours to drive, had taken them six days. After the convention ended on Friday, February, Sewell collected his horse at sunset and started home, but the horse fell. Sewell's knee was hurt so bad that the pain kept him awake that night. He doesn't tell us how the horse fared, but he must have been okay. Since Sewell set out again the next day with a few other Maine delegates, retracing his earlier trip in reverse. This time the weather was better. There were no snowstorms, no driving rains. Despite, the, uh, despite stopping in York for church and a visit with some relatives, Sewell spent only four days on the road before, before arriving home in Bath on the evening of Tuesday, February 12th, with joy. We can only imagine how happy his horse must have been. <laughs> he or she had done most of the heavy work and helped make possible a landmark event in the history of Massachusetts and of the United States. And throughout the land, between the Atlantic coast and the Appalachians, from Maine to Georgia, except for Rhode Island, and further west in the fledgling state of Kentucky, other horses were performing much the same 
patriotic service. Thank you, Alina, for calling our attention to that forgotten part of the story. <laughs> is always the fun part. <laughs> yes? Um, if you were named an envoy to the Near East, what from all this that you've learned would you tell them? If, if I were, what was the first part? Named an envoy to Egypt or Libya or Tunisia or all these countries that are struggling to create themselves. I would like to pass that to Paul <laughs> I think I, one, one understands, I think, when one knows the history of our country very well, how difficult it is uh, and how naive the concept was when we went into Iraq that somehow if you got rid of a dictator, democracy would happen, mm -hmm. that democracy is a residual, you know, like weeds on a plowed field. And how unfortunate, how, how demeaning that is to democracy. Democracy is a positive achievement. And the great thing about the leaders of the American Revolution is that they understood that they could not go forward unless they had the, the, uh, 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 the people behind them. Certainly on independence, that was very much the case. I mean, in my previous book, I noticed they would not, I, I told the story, they did not, uh, it, the Congress did not endorse independence in early June because they said the country was still divided, but opinion was ripening. They thought maybe in a month they could be, uh, be unanimous on independence, but that they had done the groundwork. The basis was there. Now, how do you build that kind of a foundation in countries where, like Libya that doesn't have the kind of roots or historical roots that had given the Americans the basis for a common identity and common political assumptions. I think we understand more. I, I, what would I tell them? I don't know what I would tell them. But I think as I read the newspaper, I understand the challenges they face. I think that's true. Uh, that I mean, what a republic is basically. I mean, the, the American Revolutionary's definition of a republic was a government in which all power came from the people, directly or indirectly, and there was no hereditary rule. Well, a, a good parts of the many of the royal colonies, of course, had governors and often upper houses that were appointed by the king and sort of were surrogates and and weren't elected. But heck, they could get rid of those very easily. On the, certainly on the town level and the county level, people had been governing themselves. In the revolution, they'd been governing themselves in these uh, elected provincial congresses and so on. So the republic came naturally out of, out, of, out, of, out of our earlier history, you're quite correct. It was a logical extension of political practices that had existed earlier. It was easier for us to make a revolution work than it is in Libya or Egypt, I think. I don't say it was easy, <laughs> but easier. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, this is a sort of a but um, I'm interested in the sources you used. And thinking about that, I, I can't remember the, I haven't read your book, the, the acronym for the, the group that is putting together. Yes, well, it's the documentary history of the ratification of the Constitution, which is quite a mouthful. I call it the DHRC. It's being published, the editors are working out of the uh, Department of History at the University of Wisconsin. So what I'm thinking is, you know, now that everything is getting digitized and online, uh, what, I, didn't, I don't know when they started that, but what did you 1976, the first volume. Well. Well, I didn't have to tramp around. That was the amazing thing. I, you know, I, I, I 
used my husband's office in Widener Library, <laughs> which is a wonderful was a wonderful place to, to work. Uh, and I, you know, if I needed supplementary materials, most of them were printed in in in, in Widener. At one point, I w wanted to see the actual journal of a convention. I mean, it was the first one I wrote on pen, uh, on uh, at the Pennsylvania convention. You know, they broke it up into pieces because in the, in the documentary history of the ratification of the Constitution, because they go do it day by day. And I just wanted to see the whole thing. I, there were some things in it I was confused about. So I went to Houghton Library. They had it, and I could look at it. Later on, it dawned on me, I didn't have to go to Houghton. I could sit at my computer and go click, 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 and there it was. Um, you know, because... It, uh, the, the early American imprints have been digitized, and uh, you can get them in a good research library. In fact, I now have an Apple computer with a 27-inch screen, and it would have been much easier. I could pull the journal up there, and I could be writing on this part of the screen. I mean, it's, it's remarkable what you can do now. Not all historical subjects allow that. But this one did, and I think in some ways it played to my comparative advantage. I don't know that I'm the greatest person for digging through archives, but I am very good, I will say, at reading documents. I see things in documents that others don't see. I mean, people have weird talents. I mean, this is a total, of no use to anyone unless they happen to be a historian. I even got into a great fight with this fellow Leffler who read it occasionally. There was one great point with the Virginia Convention. He said, you got this wrong. You got this wrong. You're talking about something, and it was something else. And I, and I was inclined to yield to him. I mean, he'd lived with these documents. He'd edited them. And then I was looking through them. I said, no, I'm right. And I sent him sections out of, you know, out of his, the documents he'd edited. And like this wonderful message from him the next morning. He said he'd made a terrible mistake. His wife had left the computer on, and he went to turn it off and made the mistake of looking at his email. And there was my message. And he couldn't sleep all night. <laughs> but I, I was right on this. I, I'm wrong sometimes. I was right on this one. But, you know, I, could, I saw them in the... It was buried in the text, but it was there. I saw it. So, so here I didn't... All of what I did was have the, the documents all pulled together. And I had to read them and put the story together. I had a wonderful time. I never had more fun than writing this book. Uh, and, and if fun writing is fun reading, it ought to be a good read. I hope so. <laughs> Sir. Uh, question about Libya and Egypt and all the rest of the nation in the Middle East. Uh, we don't know. We're living in present time, so we don't know what's going to happen yet. And difficulties of democracy. Um, you, have you imagined what it might have been like if it hadn't? We now view this as a foregone conclusion that occurred in ratification. But if it hadn't, have you imagined what other yes. might have been I, You know, I think, and, I, and Bob has heard part of this before, I think that for a long time, People didn't pay much attention to ratification because it seemed like a no-brainer, you know? Uh, it, it, of course they ratified it. Uh, but that builds on attitudes that set in later when the, very quickly the, the Constitution was treated with great rever reverence, treated almost as if it was of divine origin, you know? And you see references like this already in 1789, and they were bewildering to people who fought through, you know, the ratification contest, where you know anything was fair game. Boy, they ripped it apart. It was amazing. But what if it hadn't been ratified? Well, here I think it's important to understand that those who are, were called anti-federalists, that is, who who criticized the Constitution, did not all oppose it. I think the largest component of, the, of, of that category uh, agreed that the country was in a very bad state and the Constitution was better than what we had. Many of them said uh, this would work quite well with a few changes. What they wanted was uh, amendments that would get rid of ambiguous parts and better protect the rights of the people. Uh, and I, I challenge you to read the Constitution with, uh, with uh, fresh eyes, 
pretend it's September 1787 and that it's just been sprung on you. And please remember that the convention had not been authorized to write the Constitution. It was supposed to be proposing amendments to the Articles of Confederation. Instead, it met for four months and said, hey, you should just junk that Confederation and we got an idea for you. So if you suddenly say, oh, this is what the convention did? And look at it and read it, pretending you're living in that time. Uh, it, it, not without this, you know, divine origin kind of stuff. And I think you'll see that if you look at it in that way, you know, there are parts that aren't clear. And they said a constitution should be clear to everyone who reads it. There shall be no more than one for every 30,000, one member of the House for every 30,000 people. All right, your question is what would happen had it not been ratified? And I think what would happen is that there would have been a second convention. And given the general consensus on the shape of a better uh, national government, uh, we would have ended up with a constitution not so different from the one we have. It would have been, have power would have been divided between the legislative, the executive, and the judiciary. I think it would have had a declaration of rights. I think federal uh, taxing power might have been less comprehensive, and I think there would have been more limits on federal military power, which was extremely uh, worrisome in the 18th century. We have to remember that James II tried to rule England with an army in the late 17th century, and that the British, oh, we all know, they sent an army to Boston <laughs> and tried to rule with an army. And uh, free men, the Americans said, aren't ruled at the point of a gun. And they were worried about federal military power. So that would have been weakened. Ultimately, I don't, I don't think it would have been a disaster. The Federalists thought, if we don't ratify this, we're going to be at each other's throats. There's going to be civil war. There's going to be anarchy. I see no evidence for it. I think, it, I think we would have ended up not all that different than we did, but with those changes. And of course, a few changes in the Constitution can, can, can affect the whole trajectory of national development. So there might have been differences over time that would have become more dramatic than uh, my sense wouldn't have been so different suggests. Yes. You know, what's so nice about this crowd? Last night I spoke to the Society of Cincinnati in Washington, and that's probably why I'm losing my voice. But it was always, sir, sir, sir. There are women asking questions. God bless you. Right? And my question, as it actually is pertinent to your reaction, yeah. which in the beginning of your book, you talk about how you have a very Yes. And I wondered if you could comment on the impact her work had had on your work. Well, it's had very limited impact because I haven't read very much of it. I read her last book and thought it was terrible. I don't think it's the uh, it was a book by which she should be judged. And the the earlier books are m much more familiar, I suspect, to my husband than they are to me. So she hasn't had very much of an impact on me. <laughs> Uh, oh, her one comment, however, really did stick in my mind, for those who didn't read the book. She said you could build up tension in telling a story, even if your audience knows how the story comes out, if you just don't mention how it comes out until you get to that point. I have heard her speak once at Radcliffe when I was a, a graduate student, and certainly that idea stuck in my mind. And it explains certain things about the book. I mean, there are things I don't say, even though it may seem obvious. When John Marshall appears, I don't say the future Chief Justice of the United States, because that would give a clue that the Constitution's got to be ratified, or he couldn't be Chief Justice. You know? So uh, I, I don't pretend. I, 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 we have to take it as it comes. Uh, and, and that was that particular rule was very influential. And, and I think it works for some readers. I got email from people that say they're in the middle of the book and they say, I don't think it's going to make it. <laughs> Bill. Nine, the provision that nine 
stage would be adequate? Why not a majority? Yes. Why not unanimity? Where did the nine come from? Well, you needed unanimous consent of all the states for uh, amendments to the Articles of Confederation, which is why that was a loser. I mean, uh, Rhode Island hadn't even sent a delegate to Philadelphia. So amendments were highly unlikely to, to make it. Uh, it was clear they had to make it a more possible process in the Constitution. And uh, for those of you who didn't know, you, as I said in the speech, nine states, if nine states ratified the Constitution, said it would go into effect. But of course, only those nine states. Why nine states? Uh, I think they thought they could get <laughs> nine states. <laughs> Uh, and they didn't want it to be entire, uh, the, uh, to be unanimous. But of course, it was also a, a, a kind of a political strategy. I mean, or it could have been a disaster, if you think about it. Now, if Rhode Island didn't ratify, and you know, rat Rhode, neither Rhode Island or North Carolina ratified until after the Constitution went into effect, and basically the Senate had to threaten Rhode Island. Uh, they were about to pass a bill that would have precluded all trade with Rhode Island, and that anybody that had any in commercial intercourse with it would be subject to very heavy fines. Finally, they gave in. But uh, had Rhode Island not ratified, I don't think the country would have suffered very much. I think Rhode Island probably would have suffered quite a bit. Uh, but suppose New York hadn't ratified, and when that convention met, you know, about two-thirds of the delegates uh, weren't happy with the Constitution and were unwilling to ratify without amendments that went into effect before the new government began. And their argument wasn't silly. Uh, they said, only a madman signs a contract assuming he can change objectionable provisions later. This was Patrick Henry's argument. So the changes had to be made before the government went into effect. Um, two thirds, they could easily have said no. What if uh, Virginia had said no? What if North, North Carolina did say no? But now remember that North Carolina included what's now Tennessee. Both Virginia and, and North Carolina went all the way to the Mississippi. So they included Tennessee, Kentucky, and West Virginia. You know, this would have been a really weird looking country. It would have been a, the old disjointed snake. Would it have been viable? Um, you know, maybe not. On the other hand, you know, once nine states said yes, the pressure on the others was very hard to ratify, very strong to ratify. New York, the choice for New York, who knew it was going to go into effect, were you say, you say no and stay out of the union. And of course, uh, a lot of trade went through the harbor in Manhattan, and uh, that was going to be a, a, in jeopardy. Uh, or, or you could ratify, and then you would be at the first federal Congress and have a voice in, in uh, framing any possible amendments to the Constitution. You might even get the changes that you wanted. So it was, uh, it was a strategic decision that worked, but that could have been disastrous, I think. And it caused a lot of controversy. Because, as I said, in the independence movement, uh, the leaders were desperate for unanimity. They went, they, they delayed till they could go into the fight with Britain uh, in it for, for independence with their arms linked. And now were they abandoning it? Was the United States to become the disunited states? I mean, that provision was very controversial. Yes? Given the uh, anger that is uh, building on should still guide us, uh, and the opposition to that is that the Constitution really uh, simply is a springboard to other forms of government. Uh, is there a way that, from your experience, that the uh, effects of the Constitution can be more dramatic in the uh, present time? Be more dramatic. Or well, most Americans haven't even read the Constitution. I mean, they make a lot of noise about it. Um, I think that I, this came as an epiphany to me in writing the book that I was going to have to describe it in an early chapter or all the debates over it wouldn't make any sense. 
And of course, I also printed a co had a copy of it printed at the end so that people could refer to it. Uh, you know, I, I, what you seem to be alluding to was the question over originalism. Should we be bound by what the Constitution meant originally? I, actually, the originalist document among, among jurists is more complicated than that. Uh, but I think the, the wisest statement on how we should regard uh, the original understanding of the Constitution and, and, uh, and, and how it should affect decisions made was by David Souter in uh, Harvard's at, at Harvard commencement speech, uh, not the last one, but the previous one. Uh, and you can get it easily on the internet. Basically what he said, we should you know, have some uh, recognition and reverence for those who drafted the Constitution and understand what they were trying to do. But in many, but it, it doesn't answer all the problems that we confront. The words of the Constitution can't possibly do that. Uh, but what we, what we need to do is to try to extend it to modern situations in the spirit of, of the founders, trying to acknowledge what government by law with respect to the rights of, of the people. It's a, it's a very intelligent and sophisticated statement uh, by Souter. Yeah. Uh, I guess I wasn't very clear, but um, the question of limiting the government oh, limiting. seemed to be the major focus of our original constitution. And now that's treated as if it were a radical idea. Oh, I don't think limiting the government was the idea of the founders of the constitution. The constitution gives the government a lot of power, an incredible amount of power. Article 1, Section 8, uh, starting with every form of taxation that became collected by the federal government by itself. This was a monumental transformation compared to the, to the Confederation. Uh, it was startling, the amount of power that was given to Congress, and I should say the power given to Congress was understood to be the power of the federal government. The executive was to uh, enforce or execute the will of Congress, and the, and the judiciary was to, of course, help in that, in that activity. That this was to limit the federal government is, to me, an absurd idea. It was to empower it. continue the conversation <laughs> at the reception. And um, if you, um, and it's my great pleasure to present to Pauline Mayer, the Ruth Ratner Miller. <laughs> Thank you.